Hey, everybody. Absolutely stunning news over here this week. We have a video version of this week's episode available on our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash late night. Go over there, sign up at any tier, and you'll have access to it. Once again, that's patreon.com slash late night. Now, enjoy the show. Of all the guests we've had on this show, you are the one I feel the most comfortable being completely antagonistic towards. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. And by the way, I heard the Alpha Rat episode. So that's saying something. Well, I was not antagonistic towards him. Okay. Uh, right? That's fair. I wouldn't call him antagonistic. He was just chaotic, also. He was pokey. Yes. Poking the bear. Yes. Okay. Brian Wecht, did you honestly think about anything we were going to talk about tonight? No. Wow, so you guys just roll into this, huh? I mean, sometimes, you know, a guest will have a new thing out that I'll try to watch or listen to or whatever. That's such a lie. That does not happen. (laughs) Every once in a while. Has that ever backfired, the lack of prep? I don't think so, actually, because we own up to it. First of all, most of the people, 90% of the people we have in this show are friends. So, I mean, that's probably going to change at some point. We're now in the third calendar year of the Late Night Podcast. And I only have so many friends. In fact, you're the last friend I have that hasn't been on the podcast. (laughs) Have you had anyone with less media slash improv training? Are you prepared for the least listened to, least viewed podcast of the series? Buddy, we did a mild spoiler for this episode on a mini-sode where Brian said that we had booked our white whale guest. (laughs) And people immediately figured out that it was you and were very excited. It's not. No, it's not. That's what he was going for. It's not. You know I think you're delicious, Brent. Brent, you're sitting in a room full of books. That's a pretty fatuous attempt to pull a fat (laughs) joke out of a book joke. (laughs) I think you're a very handsome man, by the way. You know, we've been wanting to have you on the show for a long time. Yes, Brian, that was a great compliment. Leighton, honey? You're going to have to work for it. (laughs) (laughs) Look, there are no rules today. Normally, there are maybe some unspoken rules. Today, there are no rules. The only rule is there are no rules. And we're going to introduce the podcast right away. Everybody, this is Late Night with Brian Wecht. Over here, we have Leighton Gray. Hello, that's me, the one who just spoke. That was Brian Wecht. Hi. Mystery man, our white whale. Would you care to introduce yourself? Wait, wait, wait. I got to interrupt this, right? Yes. Because like, I thought you did this like an hour in. You're truly breaking the rules. This is a thing. You are so important to this show. We've been trying to get you on for two years, dude. And I want to mark this occasion. This is also the 99th episode of Late Night, which, as you have said, conventional wisdom for podcasts is at episode 100 is when they get good. So this is the last episode of Bad Late Night. And then we get to transition (laughs) to... 100 and up, where we actually can pretend we know what we're doing. So this was initially supposed to be titled the Late Night 99th Episode Cancellation Special of This is the Last Episode We're Allowed to Say Anything We Can Get Canceled For. <laughs> so yeah. we're putting it all on the table. Anyway, mystery guest, what are you? who are you? What are you doing here? Wait, no, that's not how this works. Don't you dare tell me how my podcasts work. <laughs> I've listened to enough <laughs> podcasting. Mark Marin will talk that guest up something fierce. Yeah, does either of us look like Mark Marin? And then they get to waltz in and look like a gladiator entering the arena. No, no, you've never listened to the show, have you? On every show, we let the guest introduce themselves. We put the burden on you. Because otherwise, Brent, if we had to introduce you, that means we would have to do the work of finding out how to introduce you. (laughs) The research involved. Yeah. So we're not touching that. So introduce yourself. Come on. Okay. I mean, is it fair to say that I am Brian Weck's longest running victim? Uh, How do you want me to start this? (laughs) What's your name? Why don't we start with your name? Okay. My name is Brent and I have been Brian Weck's manager for going on the better part of a decade. That's right. A glorious decade. I think it's 10 years next year, I believe. And I vaguely helped Leighton Gray manifest a monstrosity called Dream Daddy. Mm -hmm. A glorious, glorious game. See, as is your want, already you are being too modest. Yes, indeed. I don't know how to describe Dream Daddy because I don't know about you, Leighton, but 
I sadly don't remember the year long run up. That was delightful. People in the office eating Chinese food. It was fun. I mean, you can describe Dream Daddy as, as a game that came out on time without incident. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're just getting into it, huh? What part of that journey do you remember the most? And then secondly, do you honestly remember, because I vividly remember, days before it finally was going to come out, everybody freaking out and doing the back of the envelope math of like, oh, fuck, how many do we have to sell to make our money back? <laughs> <laughs> Does that ring a bell at all? Or were you so knee deep in it? Yes. You're asking me if I remember the game that I sunk a year and a half of my life into as if I don't remember the development cycle of my fucking baby that you got to be the like doula for. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, they, they talk about like, yeah, like births and weddings where you're so in the mm -hmm. moment and it's so dramatic and there's so much energy that, you know, I mean, I don't know about you, Brian, but do you remember much clarity from your wedding? Like it's just so much happening so fast. You kind of blur it out towards the end there, right? I mean, Rachel, if you're listening, all I remember is it was the happiest day of my life. <laughs> to everybody else, no, I don't really remember that much. <laughs> <laughs> Every minute of that development cycle is seared into my brain, even though the climax of that development cycle, I think, is seared into everyone's brains. It was a time. Thank you for believing in us. <laughs> oh, I will go on record as saying I was scared shitless that I convinced Darren Hansen <laughs> I was like, to trust this stranger with tricolored hair who walked through the door with Vernon Shaw of all people. And I was like, yeah, let's back him. This seems like a good <laughs> idea. Let's go for it. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Brent. I am forever in your debt. <laughs> Brent, so here's the thing. I'm going to say nice things about you a lot. This speaks to, you have amazing instincts about many, many things. And generally speaking, in the decade now, well, I'll just call it a decade, that we have known each other, when you were like, I think that's going to work, generally you're right. And you had a sense about Dream Daddy, and you were totally right. It made us laugh the first time Vernon pitched it. And then we kind of did the thing that we do, which is sort of like for to, to try to support talent. We sort of let them be the champions of their own thing, right? Because the yes is the permission to go forth. And nine times out of 10 people, it dies on the vine. And then he went... And you guys developed further and it came back like a, a couple of weeks later. It was like, okay, it's got, what about this? We're going to do this. And it made us laugh. <laughs> and then a couple of weeks later, he came back. And at some point, three months in, I think I turned to Aaron after Vernon and we'd met late at that point or whatever it was and I left the office and I turned to him and I said, I think we're producing a video game. <laughs> and he was like, do we know how to do that? I was like, nope. <laughs> we'll figure it out. <laughs> and it was sort of that doggedness of like, you guys just kept going. And no matter how much Vernon would stand up in a staff meeting and people would be like, it's a game about what? And doing what? <laughs> and he would just keep going and, and just like, keep standing up every staff meeting and just being like, yeah, we're going to do this and it's going to be hilarious. And we got there and we're like, all right, man, God bless, do your thing. But yeah, I don't know. I had a film producer one time tell me, you can build an amazing career off of success 51% of the time. Mm -hmm. That in entertainment, if you are correct, 51% of the time, that is a ridiculous track record. I think you're beating those odds. Yeah. That's something I think about a lot. We've talked about this on the show is at some point, it's kind of just volume and you yeah. just keep shitting out ideas and then executing on those ideas. Yes. Anybody can have an idea. Ideas are easy. We live in entertainment in LA. Yeah. Every kid at every retail job across the board has an idea for a movie. Everybody does. It's yep. literally about execution. That's the number one thing I wish somebody had told me at like fucking 21 or whatever it was when I try to figure out enter entertainment. It's like ideas are the easy part. It's all execution. It's all team building. It's all subjugating the ego. <laughs> it's resilience more than anything. Yeah. It's being resilient about making the thing and then being resilient when the thing doesn't work the way you thought it would. And that could be to various degrees, whereas it just falls apart completely and never shows up, or it just ends up being a different thing than you envisioned. There's, you know, various ways of a thing to not go the way you wanted it to. But eventually, like you say, if you just keep doing stuff, something is likely, I think, to succeed. Maybe that's overstating it, but I think that's true. If you really keep doing stuff, which is hard to do over an extended period of time. That's the trick, I, I think, more and more, is that you have to be yeah. lucky enough to be able to keep doing stuff to keep doing stuff. Yeah, and you have to have the self-awareness enough 
to grow from all your failures because you will fail and you will fail often. Yes. It's like the number one key thing I think that we look for when we're hiring too is like, like if you ask me about anything that failed in my life, it'll be a lot of I statements. I didn't know how to team build. I didn't have the experience. I didn't know what I was doing. I right? agreed like, to manage this dumb band. <laughs> the beatings I used to take in staff meetings for bringing up NSP and whatever. And they'd be like, what is this? It's a sex band. And like, you're talking about it like Mosaic, right? At Mosaic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The two biggest tongue lashings I ever got. Mm. The two biggest uh, stand up in front of the crowd and take the beating. This is like partner program. It just started. The general consensus was there's no money on YouTube. Like it was literally that early in the process. And there kind of wasn't beyond some basic brand deals. But it was a time that the ecosystem where if you took a brand deal, you were a sellout, right? Like you could barely sell t-shirts. And I signed uh, a band called Ninja Sex Party and a creator called Hannah Hart within the same small, relatively small window. And this is when Hannah had like two videos out that were sort of viral. And I remember head of something who won't be named essentially making fun of me in front of the entire company. And then the other time was NSP. And then I would pitch it as like, this is Spinal Tap for YouTube. And everyone thought I was fucking crazy because it yeah. had the word sex in it and ninja and it was sort of absurdist. And I mean, when was that? How many subscribers did you guys have at that point? 30,000, something like that, maybe? Wow. I would have guessed a little less than that. Might have been, might have been, yeah. I think when Danny joined Grumps, NSP had... 40,000 subscribers. That's crazy. Wow. Yeah. Leighton, can you imagine that moment? Can you imagine a time? I mean, you've been around YouTube long enough that there was no money in YouTube, right? Mm -hmm. Now you see the people making a million dollars a month or whatever the Logan Pauls of the world is just like, it's crazy. But like, that was the consensus. I was this crazy man standing up saying, you know, the, the internet is coming. The internet is coming like Paul Revere style. And they all thought I was insane. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was like 10 years ago, right? About. Yeah. This is not like, 2006 or something. This is like 2012. Yeah, because yeah, YouTube existed in that zone for a good period of time. Like, oh yeah. oh, yeah. You know, it was just sort of like, yeah, here are a bunch of videos, I guess. If you want to go see Janet Jackson's Super Bowl nip slip, that's the place. Right. Or people cooking 10,000 calorie meals with bacon. It was a lot of epic meal time. You know, like, it was just a different era. Because yeah. I look back at that content now and it's sort of like charmingly quaint. And I realized like, Oh, yeah, to a bunch of people who've been, you know, born and raised in the entertainment ecosystem, this probably looks like trash. <laughs> yeah. I remember being in a meeting with some entertainment industry types, some pretty established Hollywood people. And they were like, I don't understand why any of these YouTubers are famous. Like, what do they do? <laughs> Correct. And I'm like, well, I, I just didn't understand what was hard to understand about it. You know, people just like certain personalities. And they find certain people interesting or charming or whatever. I've never understood what the disconnect is. The thing I remember hearing is, but what are they making? What are they doing? And it's like, well, they don't need to be making, they don't need to be writing a screenplay to be something that people respond to. They just need to be vlogging or whatever, right? It's silly because entertainment has always had personalities, right? Always. Yeah. Like Zsa, Zsa Gabor. What was Zsa, Zsa Gabor famous for? Nobody fucking knows. Like there's, there, have been, there have always been people who have just been famous for being famous on some level in entertainment. Yeah. And this was an extension of that, the cult of personality. And this is also, by the way, like well after, I don't even know, like Paris Hilton or whatever one of the, yeah. you know, early 2000s incarnations of this was. This is not like... This was a brand new thing where, you know, there was some celebrity who w wasn't really particularly talented or whatever who had made a name for themselves. This has been happening for pr probably hundreds, if not thousands of years, right? Oh, yeah. I feel like the old guard, there's that dissonance there of looking at like, well, this person's famous for being famous, but they're like super rich and they've been on XYZ, whatever. But then right. with YouTube, it's like, oh, so we can just make anybody famous for being famous, which I feel like would have a lot of pushback because now that is exactly <laughs> what it is. Anybody, right. anybody. This is the part I truly feel for the cult of personality in YouTube because there was a period of time where the money wasn't great, right? So you could be famous without money. So you were essentially just infamous. Yeah. There are plenty of examples of like Gary Coleman or the people who they're out of entertainment. They would go get regular jobs and you would just be harassed and whatever. And so there was a period of time where a lot of that Gen 1 YouTubers 
I mean, without naming names, almost became like, what is it, agoraphobic, you know, where you, where you never leave your house and stuff, because they sort of had the fame that they couldn't go to the supermarket without being recognized, but they didn't have the money to go buy a house with a fence so they could sort of like, you know, if you're Brad Pitt and you're that level of fame, you buy a $100 million compound, you never have to see anybody with security if you don't want to, right? Yeah. But there was that just a really kind of an odd, dark window of some of those early YouTubers where I just truly feel for them. Wouldn't you say that still happens, though? Maybe. I think it absolutely still happens. There's an article, this is old now, I mean, maybe even eight or nine years old. There's an article by Gabby Dunn, if you don't know her. She was a YouTuber, you know, comic type person. And she wrote this whole article about being, she was a YouTuber who was making a little bit of money on YouTube, but not enough to support herself. So she still needed to get a retail job, but she was famous enough that whenever she got a retail job, yeah. someone would walk into the store and be like, oh my God, you work here. And then that was completely torpedoed. And also, the other thing she was talking about in this article is anytime they tried to advertise on their show, she and her partner, I can't remember who the other woman's name, who the other woman was, they would get blasted in the comments for selling out Yeah, in a very sexist and uncool way. So I think that still happens. I think that's a level of fame. But like, again, going to Gary Coleman, being the lead of a hit, was it CBS, NBC sitcom that was seen by... 30 million people a night. Like, that's a different level of fame. Being Jenna Marbles at the peak or Toby Turner at the peak. I have a interesting size fandom and the money's not quite there, which definitely does happen. I'm talking about the people who had the articles written about them, had the variety articles written yeah. about them. When the, the media wanted to interview YouTubers, they were interviewing them. People who were kind of the figureheads of it. You know, like, that's a different set of eyeballs. So in terms of the ecosystem of digital creators, obviously now there's a lot more than YouTube, you know, this TikTok notably and whatever else you want to throw in there. What do you think the status of being a YouTuber is in general these days compared to what it was? I mean, it's the number one job, right? Get kids yeah. say they want to do when they grow up. Just be a YouTuber. That's true. Not TikToker anymore? That hasn't switched? No, not TikToker. Well, Twitch streamer. Yeah, I would say Twitch or YouTube. And I would argue... That TikTok right now is in an even flatter pyramid than YouTube in so much as the top 5% aggregate, you know, the wealth and then it's truly everybody else. And I don't think people have figured out how to, beyond basic brand deals and whatnot, which then the TikTok algorithm tanks on you. Right. And then doing merch, YouTube is still the best. And here's what I will say. I would never, never in a million years bother to try to guess where it goes 10 years from now, because I can argue three to four times in this career, whatever you want to call it, I've said to myself, well, fuck, that's the top. Yep. That's the tippity top. Like they, oh, that person's getting 6 million views a week. Oh my God. Like that person's got 20 million subscribers. Oh my God. When I first started, I was obsessed with having to know everybody the top 100, 200 YouTubers. You'd always have a moment where somebody in a meeting would turn to you and you'd be like, do you know this channel? And you'd have to be like, I know that channel. Now, Every day, somebody will say, have you ever heard of this family, that would, that channel, whatever? And you'll look and it'll be 15 million subscribers and you've never yep. once seen a video of theirs and you just have to let that go. I don't think we've seen the top yet, man. I don't think we've seen the upper atmosphere of where this thing can go. But I don't see that as a negative. I see that as, a, as like a super exciting positive, right? Like yeah. 20 years ago, they thought a company worth a billion dollars was, you know, I mean, I still think they call them unicorns on some level, but now there's like 900 of them out there. You know, like it's crazy to still know that we're, we're on the up end of the roller coaster that just keeps going higher and higher and higher before whatever thing turns is fun. Totally. I maybe have a much more pessimistic view of like whatever the top of the coaster that we are on, it's the camera going to pull out at the moment as we're right over the edge. And it's like, you guys did this to yourselves. This is the downfall of humanity. You're welcome. It's because of TikTok. Good luck, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> because like Vine, I feel like TikTok is already a billion times bigger than Vine ever was. I'm not sure if that's even accurate, but it's interesting looking at something like Vine, which I feel like did not have many people who weren't already blown up on other platforms who actually went on to monetize stuff out of it. I'm curious yeah. if TikTok will have the same bubble burst as Vine did or if it's just already too big to you know, be comparable. And also think about this. When was the last time you heard somebody preach the gospel of Snapchat? Remember how big Snapchat was? I mean, Snapchat was the way kids communicated for like a three-year period. And it may, it's still big. I'm not arguing it's not. There's just cycles to everything. I love to kind of think about that stuff and I'm stealing this from like guys like Chamath Hapatia. If, if I'm, I'm butchering his last name, I apologize. To be fair, I have no idea who you're talking about. 
Oh, he was like one of the early Facebook guys. He's just a big VC dude. By the way, VC, for those of you who know, stands for very cool. <laughs> very cool dude. He's into venture capital that's trying to change the world. Anyway, and he talks a lot about how there's an arc to every company because you can't continue to grow at 20% every year like Amazon has done. There will be a moment where Amazon turns into IBM. Mm-hmm. And that's interesting. That's exciting to think about. There will be a moment where plateau and then it just sort of becomes the thing you invest in that your grandparents that we will invest in in retirement and old age and it's just that that old kind of whatever until somebody new comes in like you know you can make the argument that if if facebook hadn't have bought instagram they would be that company right now we'd be talking about just being like god remember facebook remember Mm -hmm. how big that was that was fucking weird right (laughs) yeah it's very interesting too the way that the different platforms kind of filter through different populations over their lifetimes. So for yeah. example, right, Facebook used to be a bunch of Harvard people. And now it's something that, you know, your mom and her weird friends are into. <laughs> well, and there was like a line graph of that demographic for Facebook over the years where it was just like, okay, now regular people are using it, but no old people are on it yet. And then older people are on it. And then kind of came the era of like SNL sketches of what's that one that's like how to censor your Facebook for your mom or whatever. Yeah. It's, it's oh, like yeah, yeah, an yeah. Andy Samberg one. Yeah, yeah. Then there was that. And now it's like, I don't know anybody under the age of 30 who actually uses Facebook. Nope. And now it's considered the <laughs> anti-vax haven of, that's right. you know, just nightmare hellscape. Oh, we're taking it political. I respect that choice. We talk about it sometimes. Facebook is inherently political. This is my thing about the really big companies I don't trust. Has anyone ever said something so taboo that you've cut it out? Just say yes or no. Yeah. It's never been something where I'm like, whoa, fuck you. You know? Yeah, not ever. It's never that. It's always something like someone's going to misinterpret what's going on here yes. and take it out of context. That's it 99% of the time. Yeah. And then the other 1% is like, maybe I'm weird about something and want it taken out. That's about it. I had a delightful dinner with the Hanson family the other day, mm-hmm. a belated Christmas dinner. And I was talking about my apprehension for coming on a podcast. And as you guys know, I tend to not try to ever do the in front of the camera I thing, know. right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> for lots of reasons. And I told Aaron the reason I was apprehensive about coming on this. And his advice is I should tell that story. Okay. You tell the story. And then if we think it's going to cause a problem, we will cut it out. Okay. Because it's talking about fans. <laughs> Tell the fucking story, dude. (laughs) Yeah, this is a lot of buildup. Either people are about to hear an amazing story or a very high-pitched beep that lasts 15 minutes. (laughs) No, no, no. The shorter (laughs) version is Matt and Ryan, right? Former editors of Game Grumps. Love them to death. Matt used to torture the shit out of me. I will forever love that kid. He's the best. They're both the best. Ryan and I have seen multiple Aurora concerts together. I love that kid. He's such a sweetie. They leave, they were building this thing and it was going to be amazing. And we knew that and it was so much bigger than what they were doing for us, right? So they go, they launch the super mega compound and all of a sudden they start to have a couple employees and like multiple employees and Matt and I would drunk text with each other. Just like, it's not as easy as you thought, huh? But you're not texting with Matt Watson if you're texting before 1 a.m. or after 6 (laughs) a.m. Or after three scotches. Yeah. So I get a hold of somebody who works over there and we're like, look, Aaron and I, I think it was Christmas or something. We just want to swing by and surprise them, right? Like give us a time in which they're recording the podcast and we're just going to bust in and give them a gift, hug them, surprise them, spook them, tell them we love them and leave, right? So coordinate it and get a time. Somebody worked over there was just like, yeah, now's the time. Come on, don't knock at the door. I'll just text me when you get here or whatever. So you pull up, whatever. I'm kind of looking around and walking through the compound. And it's gorgeous. And it's like adult. This is Matt and Ryan. And you guys know them well enough to know that they have a very adult establishment in a real business. And I think Aaron and I were sort of struck by it. Because we always wanted that. We always wanted a place to just incubate young people and like launch a thousand ships so that when we're 70 and desperate for a job, you guys have to hire us, right? <laughs> like that's the goal. <laughs> right. It's all reciprocal at this point. Yeah. And we bust in and they're kind of blown away at first. Like it's like seeing a teacher outside of school. Like, what the fuck are you guys doing? You know, like they're sort of so mm-hmm. genuinely so kind of shocked and they're like, ah, oh, Merry Christmas, uh, hug them and all that jazz. And they're like, why don't we sit down and, and we'll do a little bit of the podcast together, right? sit down, start talking. 
And I think as we're sort of wrapping things up, I just, you know, I got kind of a little emotional and I don't do it too often. And I don't know how it comes across because I am a robot who is trying to master emotions or learn how to use yes, them. Yes, we know you're a masturbating robot, Brent. We've been over this. <laughs> correct, <laughs> correct. <laughs> and I just say to them something along the lines of, I just can't tell you how proud we are. Like, this is amazing. This is everything we wanted for everybody who ever worked for us and meant it. You know, you guys know, I'm not a big complimenter, but when I do it, I try to make it real, right? Yeah. So that came out on the podcast. People heard it. It came out on the podcast. And from a normal person perspective, that sounds lovely. That sounds I really nice. thought it was, is the thing. And again, this is where my non-media training, I'm not a personality. Like, I don't know how you guys handle these situations. Or your brains are just wired differently where you're capable of navigating these things. And I, I think that's why I'm, I should be the guy behind the guy who could, you know, advise that thing, not the guy, right? I mean, that sounds hot. <laughs> exactly. And, and it was interpreted as, oh, listen to how condescending he's being. It's so pandering Come to on. these guys and whatever. And again, I've now been through enough therapy where I've learned that, well, that's projection. Like they're, you know, projecting sort of their ability to whatever. But it was hard. My logical, my very linear thinking, nothing is worse to me than when you go straight at somebody with an energy and it is turned 180 against you, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's the worst feeling in the world. Yeah, where we say something and it's totally interpreted to something else. You're like, no, that's not what I meant at all. You know, like that kind of stuff. And it's worse when it's, People who don't know you, have never met you, are all in consensus that they already hate you for some reason. Just yeah. all get to gang up and agree that what you said was not what you meant because the concept of, I don't know, friendship or interpersonal support is so completely foreign. Oh, yeah. Leighton Gray has Googled my name. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> the, the interpretation of my thoughts and actions. <laughs> no, it's just because I've experienced it. I know what that's like. It sucks. Yeah. Sure. It's the worst. I think I'm sure you told me about this when, you know, around the time it happened. You did nothing wrong and nothing you said was anything other than a kind, loving thing to say to some people that you had worked with, you know, a little earlier in their careers. I don't think I've heard that podcast episode, but you did nothing fucking wrong. And that is entirely a bunch of people trying to stir up some drama. That's not on you. And the idea that they could so accurately see through my bullshit was terrifying. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. Because in your brain, if you're not used to it, it's like, oh, but what if they're right? Because if you're not used to people just lobbing shit at you, you're just like, uh, oh, do they know me better than I know me? Right. And That's then you have the, an existential crisis for two years. Yes. Or the thought process of, well, wait, how am I coming across? Because in my head, it sounded like this. And then you begin to question your communication style and what you're saying and how you go about saying it. And that was just the line in the sand where I was like, Instagram once in a while, don't really tweet. I just retweet. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, your guys' ability to kind of build up a callus around that and sort of rationalize what's going on and work through that is it's a gift man and i know it's not been without cost sacrifice you know took years yeah i think at least in the case of this podcast specifically the fan base rules like yeah yeah. the people who listen to this show right now are really supportive and kind and cool and should sign up at the Patreon at patreon.com slash late night to support the show nice. financially. I'm probably going to edit that out. I thought it'd be funny, but it didn't really work. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's, it's great because everyone who listens is so smart and so beautiful, and they would look even more beautiful if they went to merch.late <laughs> 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 Oh, it's, it's episode 99, baby. Yeah, that's right. But like the community that listens to this show is a subset generally, not entirely, but generally of the Grumps fan base and is not the drama-stirring part of it. I would love to see more of that by liking, commenting, and subscribing on this episode to help the algorithm. (laughs) Yeah, I think part of what you're seeing there is a big, big fan base, super mega slash grumps, right? Some small portion of which will turn, and pretty small, right? Will turn literally anything they possibly can into a deal. And like... Maybe it's bad faith. Maybe it's not. It's so hard to say uh, in these cases. Uh, I'm going to say that it's mainly bad faith. I would guess it's mainly bad faith, but who knows? There is something linguistically interesting here with saying you're proud of someone. There's something weird with the word proud, saying I'm proud of someone, where some people just think that's something you can't say. 
for whatever this reason. This sounds like coming from people who've never had somebody tell them that they're proud of them, but... Well, <laughs> ah, that was the result of therapy where you realize, oh, yeah. this is you projecting. You right. yeah. need people. You need dad to say it. <laughs> I'm saying specifically with that word, there is some linguistic way in which people use that word where you can't use it that way. Whatever. It's basically irrelevant. So my point is maybe there are some good faith like things where people are interpreting that wrong and not just trying to stir up shit. I agree. It seems like the minority, but what I wanted to say, Brent is here when we do this specifically, and I'm not talking about the other things that we've done where this has definitely happened, but with this specifically, the people listening to it rule and I trust them not to make, I was gonna say a mountain out of a molehill, but it's a mountain out of literally nothing. Yeah, I think this show in particular, because we speak so often about the meta level of making things online and your relationship yeah. with online. And also, if they want to listen to this show to bitch about it, they got to sit through us talking about like the desired pair firmness for half an hour. And I feel like people <laughs> who don't, who might do that, are not particularly interested in hearing our opinions on fruit doneness. Doneness? Ripeness? Ripeness. <laughs> Ripeness. Riposity. Do you want to know the three things that I noticed? In boning up for this podcast. In whatting up? <laughs> in studying past episodes. Oh, okay. Now I am uncomfortable. <laughs> Are you prepared for the three regression lines? Did you write this down? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, yes. Go. Basically, Audrey should have a producing credit on this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> because yes. yeah. you were both obsessed probably a little bit of an unhealthy way that you're just like this amazing dad. And I, and I get it. I get it. <laughs> I can't help being awesome, dude. It's just me. <laughs> and second to that, let her know if she needs anyone to negotiate that. It's a simple 10%. Happy yeah, to do it. That's great. Would love to negotiate against Prime. Very rate. fair. If only she knew percentages, which she does actually. Two. Leighton, when are you going to Iceland? Oh, I don't know. Okay, because I listened to a multitude of episodes. You've mentioned it to me once, and I heard you mention it twice on the podcast. Hmm. Oh, God. This is like shit that happens in my nightmares of someone coming up right? to me with a list of like, here's all the shit you say too much, you dumb bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying, I'm saying, if there is a goals to hit before episode 200, let's make Leighton go to Iceland. Oh, well, I do I think like that. Leighton Knight needs to go to Iceland because I also oh, want to go to Iceland. So do I. I want to go to Reykjavik so bad. Yeah. I technically have been to Reykjavik if you include flying through the airport there. When we moved to London, we connected through Iceland. That's kind of fun. But it doesn't really count. And the third thing of note is podcast. A little porny. A little porny. Why? Because we talk about intense orgasms at the end of every episode? <laughs> yeah, just like... <laughs> It's a little saucy. It's a little saucy. Every episode I listened to had, I mean, including Alpha Rad with this MILF story and all that jazz and, 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 and a dissection of Brian's love of the word MILF or origin story of the word MILF. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. a, little, a little thirsty. We're not afraid to talk about sexy topics and do so in a very mm -hmm. sexy way. I would say that we're very intellectually porny. It's the thinking man's pornographic. Thank you. Pornography. That's exactly right. You should put that on a bumper sticker, by the way. That is a t-shirt in the making right there. Yeah. We're pornography. We're <laughs> metaporn. That's what we are. Those were the three things that I noticed in listening to past episodes. Thanks. I can only hope that my future employers just pull that third one, because that's another <laughs> fr recurring thing in my nightmares of just like, I swear to God, I'm going to land a dream job interview and they're just going to hit play. And it's just going to be me going, come, 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 come <laughs> for half an hour. Or flash forward a hundred episodes. And it's like, welcome to the fuck cast with your host. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's going to be come corner. They're going to have, yeah. you're going to have to, a section of it. That'll just yeah. be like where you discuss whatever topic of, in the news. <laughs> the come corner. What an awful. They're called uh. come quat. Brent. <laughs> no notes for me personally. You're obsessed. You're an amazing dad and it's disgusting. And I can't tell if your Audrey stories make me want to have a kid more or less because <laughs> you realize how much effort it takes to be a good parent. It's a lot it's of tough. effort, but you know, when you get a good kid, it's awesome. And we have a great kid. And when you get a bad one, you just kind of boot them. No, they, the goal is just ignore them and hope for the best. <laughs> <laughs> cross, cross your fingers. 
start to put a little away for their college education they'll never need. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. <laughs> Leighton, do you remember the time I was the lone dissenting opinion on you dropping out of college? I do remember that. Oh, I want to hear about but this. Let me say, I'm not the one who keeps bringing this up. You're the one who keeps bringing this up. You've brought this up to me multiple times. Wait, Brent, were you pro dropping out of college or anti? Oh, I was anti. I absolutely yeah. thought that was completely inexcusable that we would be talking this <laughs> this brilliant artist mind into <laughs> coming to LA, dropping out, and just being like, yeah, peace out. You're really sanitizing this. Brent, as a 24-year-old now, I think that was a perfectly sound voice of reason. Yeah. And I ended up here anyway, so who gives a fuck? Does this haunt you? Do you lay in bed and think about this? Because I'm here anyway. Well, luckily, you didn't listen to him, which is good. I mean, that's step one of working with Brent. (laughs) (laughs) No, I'm not doing that. Well, sometimes you got to know what the bad choice is to then defend it and then go the opposite way, you know? Yeah. But no, we're talking about like mid-development when everything was still very like mushy question mark. I was just a fuckhead in college. So, you know, it's makes sense. Once the game came out and it was like, oh, okay. But also you hated your college. Yes, it was bad. For me specifically, I know a lot of people go to that school and they enjoy it and that's great. Would you say scads of people go? I would say scads of sad dads. (laughs) (laughs) Rhyming corner. I'm telling you, these bits write themselves. The rhyming corner with Leighton. You're going straight for cum corner, for rhyming corner. You got any other corners? Miss the boat. Every once in a while, your recommendations will talk about the things. That, hey, have you seen Squid Game yet? <laughs> it's, like, it's like, you mean the number one streaming show on Netflix that's been out for four months? Yeah, I have. I think you guys should do a miss the boat corner because I think about that a lot of like, I just started watching Downton Abbey. Fucking great show. Which season are you on? Um, three quarters of the way through season one. Okay, that's why you think it's fucking great. <laughs> late to the game. Late nights, late to the late game. Late to the game. I was going to suggest 2000 and late. Oh, I like that. And then the, the other thing, because you, know, you come up with recommendations. Uh, have you guys ever heard of a guy by the name of J. Cole? Oh, see, this is not the right crowd for that. Sure, I know J. Cole. Because I said that in the office to a group of people, and they all laughed at me. Because yes, he's been ginormous for over a decade now. Yeah. I buy a lot of my outdoor gear from, from his store. Right, my like preppy outdoor gear. Yeah. <laughs> it would be like coming in and being like, you guys heard of this guy, uh, Yeezy? I think his name's Kanye. It's fantastic. I think to be fair, I don't think Brian or I generally recommend stuff that's like super hot, as is the running gag. It is like shit from the 70s or what I'm going to do today, which is you'll see in like half an hour. Ooh, did you theme it out? I guess you'll have to fucking wait and see. (laughs) Fuck this line of conversation, because going into this episode, I had a contingency plan of if you were going to be really stubborn and not talk about anything, or like you were being a a shy little Brent. I I had two topics that I was going to try to coax you out of your shell with. (laughs) Oh, do it. A, tell us about your Criterion collection, man. Oh, God. Look, I get it. You want to start a fight? I will outspend you on this one, all right? Brent, I'm not trying to start a fight. I have real rules with my collection. Only when you're drunk? You cannot buy them sober, and you cannot buy them in person. Luckily, you're never sober. (laughs) (laughs) I just think, I think anyone buying DVDs or Blu-rays in 2022... You got to be very principled about those purchases. Mm-hmm. You got to do it in your secret shame corner of being on eBay, <laughs> stoned at 2 a.m., being like, David Cronenberg's crash, 1996. Criterion. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And you can't sign up for that streaming service that they have. It's like, if you're going to commit to the bit, you got to commit to the bit. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So what are your most prized criteria? Oh, God. I imagine an original print of Spinal Tap, which I think is either completely out of print. And then I have, I have a Sid and Nancy that I think is still the first run that's in package. I actually have never seen that. It's Gary Oldman, right? It's interesting. My other question was, I was going to say food, question mark. What have you been <laughs> cooking lately? This is the thing that people probably don't know about you, Brent, that you're a real uh, whiz in the kitchen. Yeah. yeah. The last thing I made that was sort of interesting... So years ago, there's a couple channels that kind of got me into it. Steve's Cooking, where he made a salmon on croute. It's like a salmon with sort of a cream cheese and a puff pastry, and it sort of steams itself. It's fucking delicious. It's amazing. And then that famous Gordon Ramsay uh, beef wellington. Oh, you and I have shared a beef wellington. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Those two videos sent me on a very long path of food and food porn on YouTube. You know, that had to be six, seven years ago where I started really getting into cooking. And so I've been revisiting a lot of the original recipes that got me into it and realizing the slow progress you make when you're cooking and understanding the science behind it and stuff. And I revisited that salmon on crew recipe. I got to give a shout out to that channel. I think it's called Steve's Cooking. And it was just tongue coming. It was so weird. I just remember being in my tiny little one bedroom apartment, barely able to afford Aww. salmon, <laughs> just trying to prepare a thing. So freaked out that I was going to burn it, waste it, you know, and have to throw the whole thing away because it seems so complicated, you know, like that kind of stuff. I've had a couple people I've dated being like, why are you good at cooking? And it's like, I'm just not afraid to fuck up. Like, that's the best part. You just ruin it. You try it again. You know, just keep totally keep trying to figure out with a uh, slow improvement. Yeah. The food thing reminded me whenever we tour, if Brent comes out with us, which happens time to time, Brent is like one of the few people in that touring group with NSP where I can be like, let's go to a really cool restaurant in this town. Like, let's find a good one. When we were in Copenhagen, we looked oh. into, remember this? Going to Noma. Yeah. And then we discovered it was like $600 a person <laughs> or something. I don't even know if it was that that freaked us out. It was the fact that you had to drive like fucking three hours. No, no. Speak for yourself, dude. It was definitely the $600 a person that freaked me out, where I was like, I, <laughs> under no circumstances can I spend that amount of money <laughs> on a meal. No. To one of the most iconic and legendary restaurants that's trained every major chef in the last 10 years. Like, I don't know. Like, it's an experience. You know, like that is a once in a lifetime meal. If you did it twice... I think you're fucking crazy. Okay, may maybe. Okay. It was very expensive, though. Stupid expensive. I was like, I can't justify that under any circumstances. I also like to think the best part about that bus on tour is, yes to that, I'm down for whatever, but I'm also down for whatever. So if somebody says, let's go drive 30 minutes for dollar fifty tacos from some fucking dirt yeah. shack, I'm like, all right. <laughs> Were you with us in New Orleans? No, right? No. We went to some weird seafood shack that Matt Otley, our sound guy, knew about just to get giant bags of, you know, boiled whatevers, crayfish and crabs and everything. No, I think he brought that back to the uh, the green room. We went there and right. then we had it sent into the green room, which, by the way, was the worst smelling green room I have ever experienced because <laughs> it was tiny and sweaty and filled with sweaty twerp and full of bad seafood and full of good <laughs> but boiled and very pungent seafood and imagine opening wow. the door after your show you've just been sweating you know like an animal on stage for an hour and a half and you want to go down to that nice cool green room and take a shower and you open the door and the thing that hits you in the face is a mist of crab and it's like <laughs> oh i don't know I don't think this is the right move right now. A hot, steamy <laughs> mist. I love it, Brent, when you come out with us or when we're in the same place together when we travel because I can actually get you to go do stuff. And sometimes that's a hard sell for other people. I like exploring. I like seeing new cities, you know, and tasting the food and going to art museums and stuff. And it's a lonely path I tread. Yeah, I would say similar to Game Grumps Live, I have had some of the best conversations with Aaron and best conversations with you just randomly walking through a city. Yeah. Indianapolis. I remember with us. Yeah. Remember going to Indie PopCon and oh, yeah. walking around and just, hey, what is this city we've never been to before? Let's check it out and oh, just yeah. walk around. And just the conversations and some of the moments, the feelings, the bond, like it's insane what exploring a new city together with people you like, the amount of bonding that does. It's fun. Some of the best memories. Yeah. Did you come to the Vonnegut Museum with me? I think we did that together. I think we did. Yeah. Yeah. The idea of you guys going to a Vonnegut Museum together is the cutest thing I could possibly imagine. <laughs> oh, it gets nerdy on the road. <laughs> Brent is the best hang. You know this. Yeah. It's always fun. Do you talk about the touring thing? I mean, have you communicated to people that it is like 22 hours of boring for two hours of onstage awesome? Like that is the bulk of touring. It is a lot of how do you kill 12 hours? Yeah, for sure. There's so much prep that goes into it. Like we're lucky with the NSP tours we've done, you know, we're playing reasonably large venues, two, 3000 things. And you know, there's crew at the venues setting up most of the gear. So we're lucky. We don't have to do a lot of the setup ourselves. I mean, some of the basic stuff, but like we're not putting up the video wall or whatever, you know, we hire people to do that. But the boring is you get to the venue at whatever, like 
11 a.m. and then the show's at like nine and you're just like waiting for the venue to get ready and for people to set shit up and it's a very very long process which is not yeah particularly fun but at some point you can sneak out a lot of times it's like hey can i go for two hours and like if i set up my keyboard is that good enough and then usually it's like yeah we're not you know we're just waiting for stuff you need three hobbies to tour right Whatever those three things are. I love coffee. All right, find that coffee shop. I love food. All right, find that lunch spot. I love museums. All right, find that museum. Yep. Right? Cigars. All right. If you have three interests, you have a way to kill the time in any city you go to. Yep. Mine are, I will always go to an art museum. And because I'm a LACMA, LA County Art Museum member, they have reciprocity with art museums all over the country. And you can often really? get into free for the, Yeah. So I was just in Denver. Got into the Denver Art Museum for free because I'm a LACMA member. And so I have this card I just bring with me to every city I go to, and I'll look and see if there's a museum I can get into, even if it's not free, whatever. But being a member here opens up a lot of doors. So that, that's hobby number one. Like you said, hobby number two is food. And hobby number three is bothering the people I'm on tour with, which is <laughs> is very fun to do when I can't do either number one or number two. Accessible, cheap, and easy. Yeah, that's right. And makes touring worse for everybody but me. <laughs> <laughs> Layton, what would your three be? My three? Cheese board. I mean, like, food subcategory cheese board. I will find the good charcuterie place. Yeah. Like, all charcuterie boards or specifically cheese board? Specifically cheese board, but I'm open. My stomach is open. <laughs> you're, you're cheese open. I respect that. Yes. You're like Paul Erdős, the itinerant Hungarian mathematician who would show up at the door of a math friend with his little briefcase or suitcase or whatever, and just say, my mind is open. And then let's write a paper <laughs> together. <laughs> Except for you, it's your cheese. Your cheese is open. Have you been to the cheese shop in Beverly Hills? No, I haven't. That's a good one. Every time you walk by from the outside, it just smells like feet. Oh my God. Hell yeah. I love a foot smell. <laughs> my other one is any like weird bookstore. I will yeah. go find the haunted bookstore, just like the real specialty thing. And then wild card for just like, I always search weird things to do in X city and then mm -hmm. I will pick the most out there one and it's a go. Oh, so Iceland's going to be dope. We are all travel compatible. I think we are. I would love to go with you two. That would be so much fun. Have you guys talked about your guys' origin story on the podcast? I couldn't find that. That's a good question. This is me. This is me just observing you guys, right? On paper, this is sort of the most unlikely pairing of two people in my life. This podcast. Because we're both tens. <laughs> two tens. You know, they become two narcissists. Two tens can't talk to each other. They're all about themselves. Yeah, correct. Right, yeah, that's right. But it is like just the backgrounds. Artist, math. Let me ask you this. Was there a moment in the podcast where you guys were riffing and you realized, oh, fuck, we click. Our communication style is similar. Tell me what you think, Layton. I think that happened during our first live show. Yeah. This is how I remember it. I remember I was driving into the Grumps office one day, and maybe I called you first or we had talked about it. I can't quite remember. And I was like, I want to host a talk show. I think it'd be fun. It's something I've always wanted to do. Let's make it happen. And then I came in and was talking with you and maybe Peter and other people about it. And I was like, okay, well... I wouldn't want to do this alone. So who would be a good person? You know, initially I was like maybe as a Andy to my Kona or whatever, like a, a sidekick kind of thing. And I had just seen the Dream Daddy show at Dynasty Typewriter a few weeks before. And then someone, I don't remember if it was me, I don't remember if it was you, brought up Layton. I was like, oh yeah, she was awesome on stage. Layton and I had known each other for a while through Dream Daddy and everything. And I was just like, that seems like an awesome choice. I think it would work great. Let's do a thing and see how it goes. So then we made our first live show happen with Jack Douglas, Jack's Films, and it felt so great on stage. In planning it, I could tell that it was probably going to work pretty well, but doing it on stage was like, well, okay, no, this, this works. This is great. This is a good pairing, and I think there's some legs here. That's how I remember. And I think the deeper level of that for me was, I think maybe when we started doing mini-sodes, I obviously was like super on board and feel like we got along great from episode one yeah. of the podcast itself. But I feel like the mini-sodes, because 
thank you folks for paying for them. I feel like because it's not on a public feed, we have a little bit more license to be like more specific and we're both big nerds about a lot of things. Yes. And a lot of the same things too. Yes. I actively look forward to us doing crosswords every two weeks or whatever. I know, me too. It's so much fun. It's good shit. Has there ever been a bit that Brian did? Not that Brian does this. I don't do bit. Take that as you will. Has there ever been a bit or something he's done that has actually annoyed you? Yes, and I'll tell you. (laughs) Oh. It's Brian's insistence on making sure I'm okay with a bit that he's done that he feels like he's maybe crossed a line with. (laughs) You are too (laughs) empathetic about it (laughs) to the point that it's just like, come on, man, we're doing a podcast. Yeah, You can be mean to me. This is the struggle of being Brian Wecht, which is I want to endlessly antagonize people, but I never want anyone to have a bad time. Yeah. Even though I want them to have a bad time. But if anyone actually did have a bad time and got upset, I would be mortified to the point where I would be, you know, kicking myself for like, wow, you idiot. Why would you, you know, why would you ever push it that far? At the same time, realizing that pushing it that far is precisely what I was trying to do originally. So it's, it's this weird feedback loop of, I very much want to not like actually like antagonize people, but I want to push some buttons occasionally. I'm kind of a Rogan ask sort of figure in that way. I like to, you know, I like to ask questions. You're just asking questions. I'm just asking questions. I'm just trying to figure out the way things go. And it's not my fault that the universe is a complex and messy place. Also, I eat growth hormone for breakfast every day in a bowl. So I, I do find it very funny to annoy friends. But when people actually do get annoyed, which of course happens because it's going to, then I am mortified. Yeah. Can you recall a time in which you've ever thought you crossed the line with a bit with me? I think I've become so numb to it by this point. I just... (laughs) You you never. I mean, A, I would never actually do anything mean or cruel to somebody. But with you, I mean, you're so easygoing that you just kind of roll with it. I mean, we can give each other shit all day and it's no big deal. Here, yeah, let me pull up some photos that you've taken of me for later. <laughs> just to- <laughs> I do have a, a long running hobby, which is whenever Brent and I travel together, I try to take a picture of him peeing. And I'm not trying to get anything pornographic. I would never do something where a body part was being shown, but it's like a reverse shot at a urinal. Or from the side. My love of this right now is Leighton's non-reaction to being not surprised at any of this. <laughs> I feel like I've maybe seen some of these is the thing. Well, they're mostly for my own personal use. But generally speaking, I have like 10 to 20 of these pictures throughout the years of Brent peeing in various places. Is there like a dead man trigger somewhere that like, if you die, those just all get released to the internet. If you don't. Oh yeah, that's right. Because it's going to be by your hand. That's what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. some, some way that if you don't tap one button every 12 hours, it just instantly uploads. You know, it's like when you try to kiss someone for the first time, you're like, I'm taking a gamble here, but I think it's going to work out. I have a good feeling about this. I got to take my shots, whacked. You got to shoot your shot. So I took one picture of you peeing and then... When you walked out of the bathroom, I was like, dude, look at this awesome picture I got. And you were like, that's great. And so that I took as permission to keep doing it. That's 1,000% not what happened late. That's 1,000% not. I think it was texted to everybody who was on the bus. That is No, I would not do that. I did do that later on, but not that time. Sure. By the way, I feel it's important to say for context here, I'm a great person. (laughs) <laughs> i'm a really good guy and also just to back up real quick you did just give me full credit for the creation of late night how you're like i want to do a podcast i want to do something live and i was just like well what about late i think you're making an omission which i'm pretty sure that it was stella uh, that sounds right maybe maybe not what is the dumbest advice i've ever given you in 10 years, where I must have said something at some point that you're like, Yeah, you were like, dude, you gotta leave Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you told Brian. me that I shouldn't move here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no. As I said earlier, like your advice is generally really, really good. I feel like we have a weird bubble of a, a relationship where we're allowed to throw out 
10 dumb ideas. Sure. And it's sort of like, none of us hold the 10 shitty ideas against each other. You know, like we just sort of let it go. Yeah. I will 100% tell you the one that sticks out to me. It's kind of a running joke with me and Twerp is at the end of Danny Don't You Know, the entire song is in minor. Generally, it's in C sharp minor, but the final chord is C sharp major. So it ends on like a hopeful, uplifting. No, here, hold on. So the, the, the final chords are. And that started, that's generally happens in the chorus. And at the end, it goes. So it goes from minor to major. And when we played that demo of that song for you, Brent, at the end, you were like, I don't know. Just feels like a little much to me. (laughs) (laughs) And let it be known, I rarely give a creative note. I don't perceive my job to be creative notes. I perceive my my job to be protecting creative. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But every once in a while, you know, I will say when you do give creative notes, generally they're really, really good on that one. I was like, I just, I just disagreed. And I'm glad we did the major at the end, but that's one where occasionally we'll be playing that song or rehearsing it or whatever with twerp and that last chord will come on <laughs> and someone will go, I don't know. <laughs> just feels like a little much to me. <laughs> Have I ever told you that? Nope. News to me. <laughs> yep. <laughs> The advice, I'm always sort of mystified sometimes by the amount of advice you don't take. Like like what? Does something stand out to you? Yeah. You never hired that dummy Jarek to edit these things, right? <laughs> Come on. Oh, what? Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow, Brent. We just cut that out, right? Yeah. Jarek, leave it in. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm trying to think. And, and obviously, that was not a major thing. It was a piece of advice that I felt I was like, this is just wrong, but that's fine. It's an artistic note and I'm entitled to take it or not. Outside of the podcast, do you guys give each other like life advice? I mean, we like, you know, talk about friend stuff. Sure. Yeah. Leighton, what's the best advice Brian Wecht ever gave you? Do I give you advice? I don't think I've ever given you advice. No, you definitely don't give me advice. I definitely don't give you advice. I feel like you could get his life in order. It would be nice if you did. (laughs) (laughs) You're the go between me and Audrey, you know? Yeah. Because I feel like I save a lot of stuff just for when we're recording, which I imagine is probably a pretty normal thing that a lot of people that we know do just if Mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, we got to record shit, so we need things to talk about. But we definitely like, you know, if one of us sees something that we think the other one would like, we'll text it to each other or whatever. Like normal friend stuff, you know? Yeah. It's called having friends, Brent. That's right, Brent. You wouldn't know, you masturbating robot. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Says Brent, having a lot of friendsingly. <laughs> <laughs> to all the fans listening, the first person to send in that art submission, I'll think of some award, some sort of prize. Brett, the masturbating, the masturbating robot. robot. <laughs> wow. What are speaking of art? What are the two things behind? You? I'm sorry that I'm gesturing with a pipette. I don't know why I have a pipette <laughs> on my desk. What? Is, well, follow up question. What's a pipette? You don't know what a pipe? Did you never took high school chemistry? Oh, oh I was picturing uh, like the little pipes, the glass tubes that you smoke crack in. Yeah, Layton famously has lots of little crack vials around the house. Right? <laughs> this is so awful because the reason the pipette is on my desk is because I have a little bubbler for weed that you got to put a little bit of water in. And I needed precision for putting water into my goddamn weed bubbler. So thanks, Brent. You're like a weed chemist. <laughs> Just does. Yeah. Have you gone so far with weed that you realize it's too far? In so much as, and I don't mean about the drug itself, I mean... Oh, I spent a thousand dollars on this glass bong or something like that. Was there there was there a moment that you're just like, all right, it's no longer a hobby, it's a lifestyle choice. Oh, ew. Um, no, never, and any respectable weed smoker should know that you should not spend more than fifty dollars on a bong because that thing will end up on the ground at some point and it will yep. break. As I have experienced over and over with numerous bong heartbreaks. It's just, I have to factor it into the equation. Mm -hmm. Oh, sad. Is there like the bong that got away? Yes. (laughs) Many of them. (laughs) Is there like a dream bong? Yeah. His name was Hollyweed and it said (laughs) Hollyweed on it. And it was the best bong I ever owned. 
and I killed him <laughs> last year. How? It's called when you have a two foot glass thing that you're maneuvering around constantly. The novelty ones, the taller they get, the more breakable they are. The more somebody's going to knock yeah. into it. It's ridiculous. I go to a store and it's just like, show me a normal one because this will break. It's not a matter of like, oh, if I break it, no, it's going to. And you guys got Brian stoned. Has Brian gotten you drunk on bourbon yet? Gotten her drunk? I don't like the implication of that. <laughs> <laughs> I just mean, I just mean like there was a milestone and then Brian tried weed. Yeah. What's Brian, your bourbon man? Is there not a milestone to then reverse? I'm not like a big drinker. Yeah. Brian got me a really nice bottle of whiskey for like Christmas, Christmas last, last year, year, I think. Yeah. That I still haven't finished. Well, finish it now. All right, let's go. <laughs> It is past six. We could do a final wrap up with whiskey. That's true. Well, actually, I think we do need to move on to segments. Yeah, we do. Brent, you've listened to a bunch of episodes of this show. I want to do something that we've never done before on this show. Oh, Brent, ooh. how would you like to introduce our first segment? Would you like to introduce it? Oh, sure. I like this. Which segment? If you're such a fucking fan of the show, dude, you tell oh, me what God. the segment is. Yeah, what segment comes first? Yeah, huh? What's its name? Say its name. Is this the one where you play the song and then like... I don't hear this song. I don't know what you're talking about. Is this one of those like long protracted bits that Leighton puts up with? And No, that doesn't sound like the show at all. <laughs> no, 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 let Brent do it. Let Brent do it. He can do it. I believe yeah. in him. Okay. So Brent introduced the bit. Yeah. I mean, the segment. I forget what it's called. You're putting me on the spot here. Do you remember what it's about? Do you remember that it's literally in the email? Hold on, hold on. For some reason, I keep thinking the last dab and that's not it. That's a different bit. The last dab. Last dab. <laughs> yeah, like there's something. This isn't hot one. What show do you think you're on? Yeah. <laughs> this is a different bit. This is a different bit where there's a theme song. It's almost like you received an informational email about six hours ago that had <laughs> the name of this segment in it. Oh, we're talking about the the the. Uh, what happens in this segment, Brent? Where we give our recommendations, like uh, oh. a, a, a lemon and three. Uh, Oh, Peaches? Nope. That's the next segment. If you can't remember the name of this segment, make one up. Ooh, I like oh, that. all right. Because maybe we're changing it at episode 100 to be whatever Brent wants to call this segment now. Yeah. This worked the first time. It did. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. This is our okay. pop culture recommendation segment, which we do every week on the show. And it's called... This week, it's the BLB Corner, right? Brent, Leighton, Brian? Pop Culture Corner? No? It, Co keep going. <laughs> can, can we not call it that? Keep going. You know what? I actually like calling it the BLB Corner because it, that contains no information. It's not interesting. <laughs> it, it, it's completely irrelevant to any other time we do this. <laughs> and we're going to have to explain it. To, no, 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 no. The I'm not taking no, 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 no. PCC. Oh. Pop Culture Corner. I think first thought, best thought. BLB corner. From now on, Layton, you have to agree to this to 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 make this go. No. I'm, I'm not going to no. do this on my own. Layton, I need my mark on this thing. I need to pee on this show. All right. This segment is now called the BLB <laughs> corner. It stands for Brent Lilly's the best, and it is where we give our recommendations about pop culture that we saw. It could be a book, a movie, a video game, music we listen to, whatever it is, and it has a theme song. And that theme song goes here. Great. Okay, Brian, what's BL being? <laughs> I guess there are some things we have to think through about how we're going to change this. You think? We'll see if we stick to it next week. I like BL yeah. being. It's good. Yeah, of course you would. You came up with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll see if this falls in the column of advice you gave that we didn't take and then when you come on for episode 199 then right we'll relitigate and, and for the record generally tend to like my ideas the most so you just saw yeah. how our creative process goes yeah that idea was really good <laughs> <laughs> we can still ask what's popping no 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 okay, no, okay. no no uh, no it's yes. what's blb in you guys insisted on this you okay. stick with it okay What's BLB in? 
What's poppin'? I knew it had some sort of catchy thing. Last dab. Come on. I was in the ballpark. You were nowhere near the fucking ballpark. <laughs> you were in a different stadium in a different city. <laughs> You're debasing us by comparing us to the spicy bullshit show. Well, I'll say what's BLB in for me this week. Uh, it is some bullshit from the 70s. You called it, Brett. That's what it is. It's the album Worlds Away by the band Pablo Cruz. It's from 1978. It's like poppy, disco-y. You might know the song, I Go to Rio, which was on The Muppet Show. When my baby, when my baby, da 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 I go to Rio, de Janeiro. I think theirs is a cover version of the original, but there's some really good late 70s synth work on this and some hot disco beats. Uh, it's just a fun album, start to finish, and it is very of its time. So I think you both would really like it. I texted it to Lord Phobos earlier today, and I was like, do you know this album? And he was like, oh, hell yes. So hell yeah, I've been listening to this album for like two weeks straight. It's so great. So yeah, Worlds Away by Pablo Cruz. All right, that's what's BLB in for me. Brent, what's BLB in? We're changing this. We're, we're not sticking to this. <laughs> no, no, no. You insisted. This segment is called the BLB <laughs> Corner, and we ask everyone what's BLB in. Brent, uh -huh. what's BLB in? <laughs> Okay, now let me ask you this, because you guys have two segments, seemingly very similar, right? So this is pop culture what related. What the fuck is similar about them? <laughs> and then, and then, hold on. The next one. There are people the next talking. One is that the similarity? Is is, is 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 sort of gratitudes, but gratitudes could also be something that you're thankful you found. Sure. Like the fourth season of Cobra Kai. Oh. Is that what's BLB in? It might be. I was just making a list, but that's where I got confused because I was also grateful for the fourth season of Cobra Kai because it, it made my week. You can be both. We try not to micromanage people's preferences. All right. I'm going to give you two things, uh, especially because I don't feel like you guys talk about comic books enough on here. Oh, yeah. I think that's true. Two creators. So Karen, K-O-R-E-N, Shadmi, S-H-A-D-M-I. And the two books and the order in which you should should read them. Highwayman, which is exceptional, and somebody's going to turn it into an HBO miniseries, but it's just one of those weird, big swing sci-fi stories. Rarely do you read a graphic novel from somebody and think, like, this is a creator to watch, right? And then I read a follow-up of his called Love Addict that was a very personal story, kind of in the, um, the tone of, like, the old Chester Brown comics or Seth comics. There's a 90s style of uh, indie comic artists who would write very personal narrative stuff. Are you talking about like an American Splendor kind of thing? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So in one week, I read this book called Highwayman, which is this huge sci-fi swing. And then this other very personal story about his dating life and being sort of a love addict, right? I don't know, just one of those weird creators. I'm over the moon with that guy and I'm quickly devouring pretty much everything he's done. And then I think the other one I want to recommend, because I wrote down three, it's called Incredible Doom. Incredible, like it's spelled Doom, D-O-O-M. Mm -hmm. And it's a guy, Matthew Bogart, right? So first book out of college, out of art school, cannot believe how interesting and sophisticated and the character work. Huh. I mean, you, know, you got to figure your first graphic novel, for the most part, there's just sort of like often kind of middling in sometimes you're like, well, that, that character is interesting. This story's a little stale, that kind of thing, right? It reminded me of, okay, so Halt and Catch Fire was this super sexy TV show about the early days of the internet and Silicon Valley, or I was more Texas and the, before Silicon Valley was a thing. But it was all super very sexy, pretty people doing really fucked up, interesting things with big money. And Incredible Doom is more my experience at that time of sort of being a kid around the development or the birth of the internet and the, mm. the way it changed relationships and you would meet people online and, you know, find friends online and stuff. I don't want to blow it out of the water because it's not reinventing the wheel, but I just think as far as a first graphic novel from a new comic book creator, it is so charming and well-paced and well-written. I just think that that guy, Matthew Bogart, is going to be somebody that like 10 years from now, we're all going to be talking about his books. Mm. Those are my two recommends. This is the most excited you've been this whole show, so I love to see it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, this is the Brent that people don't get to see from That's the right. other side of the screen, you know? Like, this is the Brent. That's Brentertainment. That's Brentertainment! God, please tell them about that show. <laughs>
To be fair, this entire time I've been half waiting for the other shoe to drop of Brian to prank me and pull some sort of trick. Pranks? So, you know, I live in a bubble of fear. For me? (laughs) (laughs) I don't do pranks. Okay. Just dodge and weave. I'm just, I'm, you know, like the Matrix. No, oh, come on, dude. I, I do not prank people. I change people's okay. lives. All right. What's BLB in for <laughs> me? <laughs> Wait, actually, one of you does need to ask me what's BLB in. Leighton, what's BLB in? What's BLB in for me is. It's really awkward, right? Yeah, I love it. I'm a big Radiohead fan, have always been just a big deal. Spotify Unwrapped this year was like, hey, your top artist is Radiohead. And I was like, okay, well, that's fucked up because I pretty much only listened to OK Computer this year. So have I just been listening to OK Computer over and over? Anyway, and I had always like sort of written off like Kid A, Amnesiac, like era. And then I yeah. revisited it recently and was like, what the fuck have I been doing? What have I been doing? This is fucking it's amazing. It's so good. It's so it's good. It's so good. So this isn't even what's popping for me. What's popping for me is I did the deep dive on like all the Radiohead like B-sides and live performances and stuff. All right. Oh. Radiohead live from the basement. It's all in, in Rainbow songs. Mwah. Amazing. So fucking good. Yeah, there is a recording of Paranoid Android that was live on September 11th, 2001. Oof extremely good. And then there's a version called the original seven minute paranoid Android, which is the one that I texted to you, Brian, which has like the crazy him and organ solo at the end. It fucks. I love it. And then also I found like a Brahms versus Radiohead concert Mm -hmm. where it just like goes in and out with okay computer. And it's, it's wonderful. A Brahms piece. It's like a bunch of Brahms pieces like mixed with okay computer and they kind of fade in and out. It's amazing. Anyway. Yes. Radiohead. I am so depressed. That's what's BLB. (laughs) I had a theory at the time that I think it's okay. Computer's the super accessible one, right? It's got the hits. Uh, uh, well, I mean, probably the most accessible is Pablo Honey, right? I'm going to say most accessible is the Benz. Pablo Honey for if you're like a grungier person. Yeah. I always had this weird theory that after OK Computer, there were like two albums. You have to want to be a fan. They're not accessible. It's almost in the same way that like Pinkerton after the Blue Album, right, for Weezer, where it's just like the first time you hear it, you're like, what the fuck is this? This is not poppy. There's no hits. There's no radio hits, right? (laughs) It's like this one's just like racist and about wanting to fuck (laughs) (laughs) 18-year-olds. I love Pinkerton, the album, but God, it has some problems. Uh, Well, it it was all fucking meted out, right, pilled out. (laughs) Do you ever hear the story about that? That's actually true. Like he he had a, a, a leg that was like an inch or two shorter than the other leg and he was obsessed with it, right? So he was at school at Harvard, wherever it was, had this super painful- Rivers Cuomo. Yeah, super painful leg extension surgery where they literally just break it, separate it a little, yeah. like, you know, little fraction in the bone heels. And they, just like in Gattaca. Exactly, right? To get both legs. And it's something only he would have noticed- and it's in that haze of being on pain pills that his other bandmates like pulled that album out of him, which is why it's so fucked up and dark. Anyway, oh. I always had this weird theory that after OK Computer, that band purposefully did albums that sort of shook off the pop fandom, the radio play. That's not even a theory. That's just what happened. Oh, God, because they're so hard. Like, you have to want it. Like, those albums are not accessible. But then when you key into it, they're fucking amazing. I think I have different standards of accessibility. <laughs> yeah, of course you do. So I listen to those albums and they don't strike me as inaccessible at all. But you're a musician, like the comedian's comedian, the one who every comedian loves but never makes a fraction of the money of the big guy and the musician's musician, right? I would say Radiohead falls in that. Like, yeah. if you're a musician, you probably fucking love those albums. But to the rest of us... But you're talking about Carrot Top, of course. right? <laughs> correct. Yeah. Who knew them as, you know, Pablo Honey Creep, like those albums are not. There's nothing there for you. You know, it's a wasteland. Go the other way. It's very cool. Yeah, it's been great, especially like songs that I would have skipped past in high school. Idiotech, for one, like I always hated that song in high school and I've just been in my apartment going like, I sage come and I sage come. And <laughs> yeah, it's great. I love that song. I've been learning Paranoid Android on the bass, mm-hmm. underrated bass line on that cool. shit. And there's a ton of really good rarities and B-sides for it. They've just been around long enough. And I think the fans very early on sort of to make recordings. I just remember early days of Napster just downloading fucking shit tons of it, gigs of it. And they were like early on internet and having an internet presence. Mm-hmm. Like Hail to the Thief got leaked on the internet. Was it Hail to the Thief? It might have been. That was the first album I remember where they were like, pay what you want. I think it was in Rainbows. Maybe it was in Rainbows, yeah. Because that was 2007. And no one had done that yet. 
What a fucking dope move, right? Yeah. Like a what a ridiculous, amazing, over the top move. Oh, yeah. such a fan. Yeah, yeah. Also, Johnny Greenwood is the best film composer out there right now. What else has he done besides There Will Be Blood? Oh, he did Phantom Thread. Is Phantom Thread score is like oh, incredible. Shit. I mean, it's really, really incredible. Do they have a criterion for that? I don't know. Are you drunk? <laughs> Not yet, <laughs> but you're seeing into the future. He did Licorice Pizza. Oh, okay. So has he just been collabing with PTA? Yeah. I don't know if he does other stuff, actually. Those are the ones I know. And obviously didn't go too far back with the PTA stuff. But yeah, the Phantom Thread score is just amazing. I believe it. One of my favorite film scores in years. Oh. Uh, Highway Man. Brent, read us a story. Show us a page. No, you said if I could actually pull it from my shelf, that would be dope. You're not going to show us the inside? Give us like a kindergarten teacher? Jesus Christ. What the fuck? Doing it, it's also in reverse. That's not going to do anything for you. That definitely looks like the outside of a book. Show us the goods. You won't believe this guy's incredible work, which is all inside <laughs> this thing. <laughs> that I won't show you. I think it's also, it's like a cooler version to me of, um, what's that train TV show that's sci-fi TV show everyone loves? Snowpiercer. Yeah. It's like a cooler version of that to me. Isn't the cooler version of Snowpiercer the show just Snowpiercer the movie? <laughs> yeah. Which I think it wasn't originally Snowpiercer the comic. Was it? Oh yeah, I think it was, right? I think there was a piece of IP based before that. All right. All right. Anyway, final segment. Peaches of lemons. Peaches of lemons? Peaches <laughs> and lemons. We each share three peaches, which are good cool things, and one lemon, which is a crappy thing. And the theme song goes right here. Peaches and lemons. Hooray, that was the theme song to Peaches and Lemons. We're each going to start with a lemon. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. <laughs> yes? Did we talk yet about why I was the white whale? Just because I asked you to be on the show like six times and you were like, no. And were you supportive of this, Leighton? Oh, I told Brian to harass you and take as many urinal pictures as he needed to to blackmail you into what? coming onto the show. <laughs> what did you think the fans wanted to hear out of curiosity? Nothing in particular. I just like talking to you. That's it. Yeah, this was not like a for the fans decision, yeah. even though I will tell you they are extremely excited. Oh, God, and the numbers are going to pan out. <laughs> but we, we just like talking to you, and you're a good get because you don't go on other things. People don't say no to come on the pod. That's not yeah. true. We just don't ask many people. People don't say no to me. The next time I come on, can we go just like deep on Brian Wecht? Yeah, get as deep inside me as you want, Brent. Hell yeah. It's very interesting, Brent, that you'll come on, but you won't talk about yourself. You're very good at deflecting. To be fair, I feel like that's the interviewer's job. <laughs> you can go fuck yourself in hell. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I tried. I had my two questions. <laughs> How about this? I say episode 199. We collect all the questions that the fans have from 99. And we answer them unfiltered. What about we record part two of this. We do not release it until oh. episode 199. <laughs> wow, it's a time capsule. <laughs> so like two years from now. That's a very interesting idea. And I like that a lot. We could record it and release it as a Patreon goal. Or here, hear me out. This means we have to do less work. We don't record it right now, but we do say that we will have a two hour episode for Patreon as a Patreon goal. Because we have to get up to 666 for the devil's lettuce. But there's like a milestone yeah. in between that. It's like 500. Yes. Yep. And we're about 100 away from that. You know what? I'll say my lemon because we're doing lemons. My lemon. Layton, what's the number one my question lemon, you think my lemon, fans want to hear my lemon, about me? My lemon. My lemon. My lemon. My lemon. My lemon. My lemon. Get Like what's the number one my thing? My lemon. What's the, what's the number this, one thing you You guys are already is, making a radio head track. Yeah. Look at this. This is off of Kid A. <laughs> that you guys think people would find interesting. The question was, what's the number one question? Yeah, I'm always happy to talk about myself. No, no, I, I actually have a good answer for this. It's that my lemon is that last night, I had the worst night of sleep that I've had in recent recorded memory. And I have no idea why. It was just an awful, awful night. I feel great right now. I'm going to come crashing down. Were you wearing your face hugger? I'm trying to. Yes, that's part of it. I have a CPAP machine out, Brent, as you know. Has that made a difference? I didn't use it while I had COVID because my nose was clogged. So I'm starting it again. Right now, all I can say is it's definitely not making me sleep better. But also, I feel like I have to give it a chance and really get used to wearing it. 
So, but right okay. now, I just wake up every 20 minutes with the idea in terror that there's something clinging to my face, which there is. So, it's not helping me relax at the moment. But, you know, you got to give things a chance. I don't want to just give up on it. So, I'm going to give it a month or whatever. And if there's one thing I know Brian Weck loves, it's change. It's like, I love change. I could eat it all day. <laughs> Wonderful. I have a lemon. Yes, please. My lemon is that I recruited Vernon into watching The Sopranos with me because I got to a certain point, as I've mentioned on the show, and I had to stop because I was too emotionally fucked up over it. Well, the thing is, is that we got to the episode that I had to stop on and I picked up and watched some more of season six. But the episode I'm talking about, Sopranos Heads at Home, is long-term parking. You know the fuck why. So I had to rewatch that the other night with someone who had not seen it and did not know what was going to happen. And it was like pulling teeth out of my skull. Um, <sighs> and it was great. David Chase, thank you. That was a Terrence Winter written episode. I haven't seen it since it was first on. I'm yeah. the precipice of watching The Sopranos, so. We're doing it. We're doing it with Jory, God We're doing damn it, it with Jory, yeah. As a Patreon thing. I have a fun factoid because I watched an interview with Terrence Winter who wrote that episode on, you know, his process writing the episode. He wrote that episode in three fucking days and what they shot was a first draft. And it's like the best <laughs> episode off. of television. <laughs> Fuck off. Like, God, dude. I, I hate those stories. I heard Paul McCartney on Stern the other day and he was just like, all they ever do is talk about, yeah, I wrote that song in like four hours and two hours. <laughs> hey, Jude, just sort of poured out. And it was the first, it was like, yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, all the all the vocal takes on OK Computer were first try. They're just Tom York running around that fucking mansion, hollering into a staircase. You know, there is something magical about the first time you lay something down. We do this all the time with NSP stuff. It's just like, first one was the best. Just keep it. We do the Chopin thing. Chopin would do these things where he would improvise these things, these pieces, and then pour over them endlessly to make sure that it was what he wanted you know, would he change this? Would he change this? Would he just, and then would occasionally just go back to the first thing. Cause like, he was like, no, that, that had the vibe. Fucking brutal. So, all right, Ugh. Brent, what's your lemon? This is always a tough one for me. Cause I can gripe about anything, Brian, you know that. Mm -hmm. <gasps> Did I just hear a special boy in the background? That was him at my feet. Show, show dog, dog, show dog. dog. We almost had a cameo. He got fed up of hearing me talk. It's interesting. Cause I'm available at cameo.com slash <laughs> Do you ever post your cameos at your Patreon, which everyone should subscribe to for that amazing content? You know what? I don't. It would be awesome if we put them on shirts, like the moving shirts that you could purchase at merch.latenight.com. <laughs> that's an interesting <laughs> idea. Comment, like, and subscribe below if you think that's a good one. Yeah. Lemon. Coyotes. Are you guys familiar? Layton, yeah. <laughs> you've got a little loved one. I do. She's <laughs> asleep. You can tell because she's not screaming in terror. Yeah, in the background. because she's not screaming. <laughs> I've got this weird thing lately where, like, my neighbor. At what address? <laughs> I only just moved to the east side a couple of years ago, right before the pandemic. And I've never really lived in a place where coyotes just like freely roam the street. But I swear to you, post pandemic, human beings locked inside, they've gotten so much more aggressive. Mm -hmm. Just like me. <laughs> and it seems like. There is literally nothing you can do about them. And then if you Google coyotes, like they attack kids, they attack humans, they eat everything. Like, okay, are we, are we talking about me? My ears are burning. <laughs> is this the weirdest stripe? <laughs> I, are, are we allowed, are, allowed to talk about animal cruelty? Why are you not allowed to like trap and or hunt a coyote? <laughs> <laughs> is this a hot take? I don't know. I'm imagining you sitting on your bed, like your beautiful little overlook with just like yeah. hunting Yeah, he's rifle. got a steel pan backwards on his head and he's wearing camo. <laughs> and the, the fun part is when you Google coyote, you could do it right now. And they'll, there'll be the list of questions of like, are coyotes dangerous or whatever. And they'll always do this thing of like, well, they eat uh, insects and fruit and yeah, have been known to attack human beings. But they also, they sort of eat chicken and they're sort of, <laughs> like they, they try to sort of bury the lead of like, no, they attack dogs, they attack cats. And you call the city and there's literally nothing you can do. My neighbor next door, I saw him wandering around with one of those like long metal flashlights one night. And I was asking him, I'm like, well, are you worried about uh, uh, tripping and falling in the dark? And he's like, no, the night before, two coyotes were on either side of him on the street, both progressing towards him and his dog slowly. Hmm. 
he had to pick the dog up and run in a different direction. Yeah. I love that one of the first articles that comes up is just how to avoid conflicts with coyotes. Like they're already on the harm reduction yeah. Look, stage. They're not going to wear a mask. And if you ask them, they're going to be dicks about it. So don't wait, bother. Wait, what is, okay, here's my, here, okay, here's my gripe. What is the demarcation line between this is an acceptable animal you have to put up with, like say a skunk or a raccoon. And hey, this is a distant relative of a wolf who in any given moment will hunt in packs like fucking Velociraptor and take out not only small children, but animals as well. Like, what is that demarcation line? Like, when are we allowed to hunt back? This is like the fucking wolves of Paris all over again. What I'm hearing is your concern for the safety of your dog. And you must simply transmute that into aggression. What I'm hearing are the sounds of a man who's about to be canceled. <laughs> are we not allowed to hunt them? Anyway, that's my grape. Then the coyotes will be your only company, Brent. They will converge <laughs> on you in the night, howling. The voices of the canceled still join them. But apparently that's what they do. They'll send one into a yard, lure a dog away, and then the whole pack of them will fucking stop. That's horrible. Wow. Correct. I hate that. This is now yeah. my lemon that we're talking about this. Yeah. <laughs> All, right, All right, peaches. I'll go first. Here are my peaches. Number one, we finally got this guy on the podcast. That's my first peach. Brent's on the show. Been wanting this to happen for a long time, and this is going exactly as well as I knew it would. So, which, by the way, I'm not committing to which way that is. This is great. I knew it would be great. You're crushing it, and I'm happy you're here. Peach number two is I got a pod table back there. See that table? I got a table for the the little garage studio here. So when we start recording in person again, if that ever happens, we have a better place to do it than we did before. But so that was peach number two. I got that. And I got it at the Ikea in Burbank. And in Burbank, we picked up some big subs at Santoro's Sandwiches, Santoro's Submarine oh, Sandwiches, yeah. and then went to World Empanada to get empanadas for dinner. So we had some real fun foods in Burbank. And we almost went to the Donut Hut to get donuts there too because that place also rules. But fun foods in Burbank. That's peach number three. And peaches. I do that every week, Brent. And peaches. That's my move. Do you think Jarek keeps like a running list of clips of things that he knows will get Brian canceled? That he just like... Nothing gets me Do you think canceled. there's a hard drive somewhere that just like clips of... Only God can cancel you, Brian. Yeah, only God can cancel a tree. That sounds like the tagline, by the way, for like one of the really bad Mark Wahlberg movies. Only mm -hmm. God can cancel you. <laughs> I heart Huckabees too. Okay. Well, yeah, Mark Wahlberg has proven to be uncancelable despite the hate crimes, but um, anyway. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> She's talking about his movies. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, my peaches. Number one, Brian, you introduced me to Wordle, which we started doing on the minis, which mm -hmm. is a super fun new word game. Yeah. But that's not the peach. The peach is that the folks on the Discord started doing it every day and sharing the results. And then someone made a ripoff of Wordle that lets you do more than one a day and you can customize how many letters you do, which is mwah, amazing. Great. So that's peach one. Number two is that I haven't played bass in a couple of months and I just picked it up again so I could learn radio ad songs. It's fun to get back into because I've almost been playing for a year now. Like I'm a month shy of wow. a year. Am That's I any awesome. better than I was then? No, but it's still fun and I enjoy it. Is it going to blow your mind when you see Radiohead live? Are we doing a road trip? Oh, I've never seen them live. I'd love to see them live. For when they play oh, really? live in Iceland. Yeah. Oh, with Sigaros. <laughs> that would be fun. You know, they talk about with Tool that like Maynard's voice is just as good as on the records. Mm -hmm. Radiohead live. I swear to God, the first time I saw them live, I was just like, this has to be a backing track. When did you see them live? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you the year, Leighton, because then you're going to realize just how much older I am. You're younger than I am. Is that true? Yeah, you're like a couple years younger than me. Remember? Did you think Brent was older than I was? I plead the fifth. Answer carefully. This. Oh my There's God. No. Come on. What did you think? What did <laughs> you think? You have to answer this. No, it's not a thing that I consciously think about. I think maybe Brent is mildly more like intimidating than you are, Brian. Uh, okay. <laughs> Hell yeah. Did you hear that? Jared, clip that out. I'm going to need that for like my cell phone, my ringtone. <laughs> clip that out. I think maybe Brent is mildly more like intimidating than you are, Brian. She said mildly, mildly. 
Don't I'll freak out it. over nothing. Shit. Mildly. What year? <laughs> Stop being a baby and tell us when you saw Radiohead. Uh, I'd have to ask my friends from Orange County. Like we used to again. What a story. Napster. You won't believe what year I saw Radiohead. What year did you see Radiohead? I don't know. I guess I could ask someone. Was this just to extort me? It had to be 2001, 2002, somewhere in there. Oh, yeah. That makes you sound ancient. No, it doesn't. Because we used to literally burn onto CD rarities and B-sides. Because, again, they were one of the first bands that let you do that. Or not let you. You were just doing bootlegs? Oh, God, yeah. Because I went to school at a college that didn't understand what peer-to-peer stuff was for the first couple of years mm. that I was there. So they didn't know how to turn it off. They would just see these ginormous spikes of web traffic <laughs> and just assume, you know, a lot of kids do a lot of research, just a lot of research, and we were just ripping. Now, that makes you sound old. Yes. And then my third peach is that I'm waking up consistently early and eating better and That's great. drinking water and taking my meds on time. So just like I'm functioning. That's my third one. That's awesome. Is it like crazy noticeable? Yes. It has been a lot of concerted work, but it's just so I don't either have a manic episode or slip into a darker depression. So I'm at like a cruising depression right now. It's like darker. I noticed that a little er. <laughs> darker. Er. Oh yeah. I've got a baseline depression. That's just kind of how I am. I think both of you have known me long enough. That's just sort of where I cruise. But now I'm like a healthier taking more care of myself baseline depression. I apparently was diagnosed with having a um, huge penis cloud, <laughs> a dark cloud. <laughs> That's the one that you apologize for. I just had to. Sorry, say. I thought we were talking about mental sharing, mental health stories. Do you see what it's like, Layton? Do you see what it's like? <laughs> I don't know why that got me. Oh, I cracked myself up. Uh, sorry. Continue. Wait, no, Brent. You have a cloud of what? Noxious gas? No, just like a type of brain. It's like a, is it Peanuts? Wasn't there a character? Yeah, I said, I said like, a huge penis. <laughs> peanuts. <laughs> peanuts. <laughs> You're thinking of Pigpen from Peanuts. <laughs> the character who had the largest dick. Honestly, <laughs> my first thing was going to be about you. I'm crossing that off the list. Fucking fine. I don't care. Cross it off. I'm going to replace you with Cobra Kai season four. I do you like them apples. Well, couldn't give a single shit. (laughs) Do what you want. I'm not you. I can't control how you feel. Therapy's taught me anything. It's that. Do your worst. (laughs) Can we move on? Is this going to be all right? You're the dick guy. The guy with the huge dick. Like, fucking do whatever you want. By the way, now there will be two contrasting things about my penis you could Google. One huge the other smelly, smelly. <laughs> thank you super mega <laughs> dory also perpetuated that one to be fair and they're not mutually exclusive and in fact <laughs> probably are comorbid <laughs> i have a mom that would rather google my name than call me directly to find out how my life is going so thank you super mega aces <laughs> big <Wow>. mood <laughs> <laughs> all right patrick boyle which by the way worked uh, a professor Queen Mary of University of London. That's where you were, right? That's where I was. <laughs> yeah, no shit. That's where I was a, a lecturer, yeah. Patrick Boyle is an econ finance professor there who's been doing a series of videos on YouTube. There's a whole vertical of finance YouTube. There's like real estate YouTube or whatever, but finance YouTube, for the most part on real estate YouTube, it's a bunch of 24-year-olds telling you how the real estate market works. So to get somebody who was a VC, has run his own funds and firms, who talks to you about breaking down finance and economics. It's kind of cool. You know, when you get people who are doing the thing, telling you how to do the thing, right? Yeah, totally. Epic History TV has been what I've been falling asleep to lately. Are these separate peaches or one peach? Yeah. Okay. Epic History TV, also a great channel I've been falling asleep to. They have a whole history of uh, Napoleon's Wars, which sounds really boring, maybe, but it's like four hours of going battle by battle by battle through the highs, the lows, the turns. And I don't think I realized just how important the history of Russia has been in both the Napoleonic Wars and also, you know, like World War II, just the idea of fighting a war on both fronts. Just weirdly, a channel that I would put on to try to fall asleep to and ended up listening to fucking three hours of the thing. It was crazy. That's awesome. And then let's see. There was one about me, I think. (laughs) I wrote down very heartfelt ones. and, And then I also wrote a list of pop culture. Say a heartfelt one. It doesn't have to be about me, but it definitely does have to be about me. Leighton, one of the things I appreciate about you, entertainment in L.A. 
There's a lot of people who are a mile wide and an inch deep when it comes to conversation, right? That it's often small talk and sort of like, you know, hey, how's the weather? Uh, fucking, did you see those coyotes? It's crazy, right? Like it's a lot of that shit, right? And I feel when I say I feel like an emotional robot or like a robot learning emotions, it's because I fucking hate small talk for the most part. And I like to know how people work and really try to get into the nitty gritty of shit. And I appreciate the fact that I feel like you are the same type of brain. Better to go deep than wide. It's a rare find. Thank you, Brent. That's very meaningful to me. I appreciate your brain. I appreciate your brain as well. Yeah. Brian, he just set you up for like five dick jokes, and I was hoping you were going to jump in, but... No, no, no. Brian's off the list. Cobra Kai, season four. Fantastic. I think possibly one of the best seasons so Sorry, far. Sorry, my dick is like a mile <laughs> wide and an inch deep. <laughs> That's like, you really showed him. No, Brian, I said this to Aaron the other day. So the order of operations, Layton, was I met Dan through Friends at Maker. And he was just like, hey, I have a couple questions about my business. Would you mind giving me some free advice? Yes. Right. Which is trying to be in the community, whatever. And then it was months later, I felt like I met Brian and just sort of saw the dynamic between the two of them and had that thing, but you know, they were with somebody else at the time. And you know, I don't poach. I'm not a poacher. Fuck that noise. It's bad karma, bad juju. Manager wise. He's talking about. Yeah. Manager wise. Yeah. Bad karma. <laughs> Animals fair game. Yeah. Coyotes. <laughs> right, like, huge dick kills coyotes. <laughs> with his dick. Yeah, that's right. The, uh, <laughs> we had dinner at a Thai food place. The first time we ever met Brian, right? No, it was Chinese. Chinese? Yeah, it was a Chinese place on Melrose. And I distinctly remember coming away from that dinner, free advice, being pissed that I couldn't be in the NSP business, right? Just because I was just like, I get it. I see it. I understand like what the next three, four, five steps are, right? Like that thing. Mm -hmm. And honestly, it ended up working out. We ended up working together and literally your trust and faith in me as a baby manager, as a young manager, because I was getting into YouTube and nobody was getting into YouTube. Like that was crazy. Nobody represented YouTubers. Again, there was no money in there. But your guys' faith in me has led to literally everything. The dog, the library, Frank Miller art. <laughs> it is your trust in me and the, the amount of faith you put in me to help you guide this thing. It's crazy. You know, it's mutual. Like, I wouldn't be where I am without all your help and advice and enormous penis. Hold on. I have to go on Reddit right now and post about how what French just said was super condescending. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, no, but seriously, I really do appreciate that. I sometimes forget that with the crowd you're currently with, NSP was where you started, and then Grumps was after that. Just because in so many things, it's, you know, Grumps is like the bigger brand or whatever. And then NSP, it feels like a, a smaller thing. I forget that that was like the first step towards all this. So, and, you know, look, you don't work with someone for 10 years. And if that's not working, it would have been over by now. And not only that, now you are one of my closest friends. And, you know, like Rachel and I talk occasionally, should we leave LA or whatever? You know, a lot of people are going out of town. By the way, the big shocker there that he and Rachel still talk, but go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> One of the big things that keeps me here is knowing that I have you, such a dear friend and amazing collaborator, still here. So you are one of the reasons that we haven't left because I want to be where you are. Wow. Thank you, man. I feel bad for all the private schooling that Andre's going to go to because of the California education system. Yeah. You know? So I feel somewhat obligated to make you more money. <laughs> but you know, it's, a, it's a vicious cycle that just keeps going. Speaking of that, I took her to the park the other day. And she immediately makes friends, but she was talking to these kids. They were talking about schools and they asked her, where do you go to school? And she goes, I go to a private school because I'm really good at math. And my parents think a public school couldn't handle me. <laughs> and I was like, no fucking way. Yeah. And I pulled her aside afterwards, you know, when we were driving back home. I was like, honey, that is not the reason we sent you to a <laughs> private school. And it's also not something to throw in people's faces. Like 
some of the smartest people in the goddamn world didn't go to private school. So that doesn't mean anything about like, yes, she's brilliant. And I tell her that constantly, but it's not a thing of superiority. But I was so embarrassed when she said that. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> Layton, let's recreate that conversation, but how it really went down. Hey, um, sweetie, like it's accurate, but you can't <laughs> tell people that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's correct. Your mom and I know you're superior in every way, shape, and form. Oh, no, and believe by me. my genetics, you'll be better at math than most, but they'll be intimidated by that. <laughs> if I had one-tenth of the confidence that Audrey has, I would be unstoppable. Can I do an honorable mention? Yeah, because we're never having you on again, so get it out now. I'm going to do honorable mention of, again, the Hanson family, the Hanson household. Christmas is my favorite time of year. Always has been. Love it. Love Christmas. And I'm not religious or spiritual. I just family and travel and snow and gift giving love language is gift giving for me so just like there's a whole bunch of things tied into it right childhood memories all that jazz and unfortunately this year a bunch of my family tested positive on christmas eve in the morning so for having a huge dick christmas was canceled (laughs) the the dick was the canceling but (laughs) there's so sat alone christmas day with lincoln my dog and i think you know came back from christmas break and aaron was like how was your break and i was like you know it is what it is, right? Whatever. And then a few days ago, like, you're coming over. And I was like, okay. You know, just assuming that I was just going to come over and like, just hang out. We hang out on his balcony, right? And sort of shoot the shit, talk about life. Full Christmas dinner. Aww. Ornaments all up. Aww. Santa dropped off presents for me. Had a stocking with whatever. Christmas music playing. Eggnog. Oh, that's so sweet. Honorable mention to the Hanson clan for recognizing how important that day is to me. And also... I just think it speaks of to sort of the generosity of this circle of people. I mean, all of us, you know, Brian, you and I talk about all the time. It's just the end of the year steak bottle swapping thing we do. Hey, that's, it's a highlight. <laughs> it's yeah. a very generous community of people who look out for each other, which means a lot, especially in this day and age. This is what Brent is referring to there. Every year around Christmas time, we go out to a nice steakhouse and have dinner and give each other a bottle of bourbon. Sometimes at that meal, sometimes later. This year, that's probably where I caught COVID, so it's kind of a mixed blessing. <laughs> but I still value that tradition. I wasn't sure if that one was going to come up in this episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> look, you take the good years, you take the bad years, Wecht, all right? <laughs> yeah. No, look, I, honestly, I have no regrets, of course. But it's an amazing tradition. The dinner part we had to skip out on last year. We went to the Smokehouse in Burbank this year. It was great. I'd never been there for dinner before, and it was a, just a wonderful meal with, with a dear friend. So old school. Yep. Look at this love fest. I know, this is right? Great. right? I love to see it. Brent. Well, hey, that's. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't have it. I have one more note. Because yeah. you, inv- you invite a manager onto a show, you're going to get lots of ideas. Let's stick yeah. the landing. Let's figure out an ending bit, huh? Go get your dog. I'm so tempted to just kit stop right here after you said stick the landing. <laughs> <laughs> go get your dog, Brent. We want to see the dog. Yeah, yeah. Let's yes. see the dog. Right. I'm going to hang up. I'm going to hang up right now. <laughs> oh, here we go. Here oh, we go. Oh, my goodness. This is for the Patreon fans. Oh, yeah, Lincoln. This big boy. Oh. Hi, beautiful. I walked over. He immediately laid on his back and was like, he's coming to burn my belly. I can feel it. And instead, I picked him up. <laughs> <laughs> he loves it. Tell everyone about your beautiful dog. He is the sweetest, kindest baby angel. <laughs> Ooh. Only hates one thing. One thing. Your smelly, enormous penis. (laughs) (laughs) Coyotes. (laughs) Wakes up when they start howling at 3 a.m. Will immediately start barking at the top of his lungs. The only time he barks. Does not bark. He's actually kind of a mute. It's kind of a thing. Hates coyotes. Absolutely hates them. And we're pretty much codependent. This is... is We just got a yawn there? Oh, yeah. We got a big boy yawn. Wow. Wow. Dude, thank you for being here. This was so much fun. I know you had reservations, so I want to thank you for overcoming those and being a part of this, because I think this was a absolutely delightful episode, and it was a pleasure to talk to you, as it always is. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you for nudging. <laughs> yeah. It's been a lot of fun. I dig the shit out of both of you, you guys. I am so happy that you stuck with this podcast. I think the fear of most podcasts is you'll get to episode three and be like, oh, I don't know, is this worth it? Is, is the juice worth the squeeze or whatever? It just keeps getting better and better and better and better. I'm genuinely excited for episode 200 in Iceland. Yeah. 
Same. Live in Iceland. <laughs> We're doing it. <laughs> yeah. Brent, thank you. This was a treat. You know, seeing as it is episode 99, there is a handful of things that we normally say at the end of this show. Mm-hmm. But uh, you got any ideas? Do you want to close this one out? Oh, yeah. What's our new catchphrase? Like, we always have a little catchphrase or a slogan we say. Like, yeah. normally it's something like, smell you later, or, <laughs> and that's what the baby said. You know, just our usual, yeah, yeah, yeah. usual stuff. Just got to end it with the big dick energy. No, try another one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can I suggest an alternate for that? Yeah. Smelly dick energy. (laughs) That's just like a statement. Like you need to address the listener. (laughs) Yeah. You need to tell them, give them an imperative. Tell them what to do. Yes. Oh, okay. And it's not to Venmo you stuff, by the way, before you say it. Damn it. (laughs) I would say to the people who are listening to this, they're probably down the rabbit hole of YouTube and digital talent. And I think YouTube in general and social media can sort of like- This is a very long catchphrase, but (laughs) Yeah, this isn't very concise. Hold on. Be kinder to yourself because nobody is going to be more hard on you than you. More self-acceptance and forgiveness. Yeah. The only thing harder than people on themselves is your enormous, disgusting penis. <laughs> That's the end of the episode, guys. Goodbye. Bye. Late Night is produced by Brian Wecht, Leighton Gray, and Jarek Centeno. Follow us on Twitter at Leighton Night, on Instagram at Leighton underscore night, or email us at Leighton at gmail.com. <laughs>